Greetings. Uh, the Lunch and Learn program is, uh, is brought to you by the Western Institute of Lifelong for Lifelong Learning, excuse me, you see it either way in print, um, and partnering with uh, Western New Mexico University. And uh, I am the coordinator for Lunch and Learn for this uh, academic year. Now, uh, before I uh, turn the uh, the uh, turn to uh, Frank, the president, Frank Merritt, president of, of Will, who has a few announcements. Uh, I want to make a few remarks about next week's presentation. Uh, when I was putting together this uh, this lecture series, uh, one of the participants had a conflict and had to withdraw, and so I recruited myself uh, to fill that void. <laughs> and so. Next week, a week from today, I'll be talking about a, um, a forest firefighting, a fire suppression crew, a hotshot crew, uh, in Southern California. Um, they're called the El Carrizo Hotshots, and that crew has the uh, unfortunate distinction of having been involved in two fires that proved fatal for some of their members. Mm -hmm. The first of those is in 1959 when three of their members were killed. The second one was in 1966 when uh, 12 members of the crew were killed and 11 members, other members were critically or severely burned. Uh, I joined that crew four years after the first fatal fire and I had just returned to go back to school a few weeks before the second fatal fire. That second fatal fire will form the basis of my remarks to you next time. Uh, it's, it's undeniably uh, melancholy, but I think that given our hypersensitive or hypersensitivity to wildland fires uh, uh, throughout the, the American West and most certainly here in our immediate vicinity, uh, that it might be of interest to try to analyze what happened on that fire, what went wrong and why. Uh, so that's, if you're interested, that's what you have to, to look forward to next week. But I want to emphasize that the venue for that is going to be in a different room. They've changed the venue for our next Lunch and Learn presentation. All of the others, so far as I know, will be here in the ABC complex. Uh, but the one next week is going to be in the Memorial Building, the Student Memorial Building on the third floor in a room that is referred to as the Classroom. If you know that third floor, this is a room that is immediately adjacent to the one that has the, the plaque on it that describes it as the seminar room. So we'll meet there uh, at noon a week from today. Now, I know Frank, uh, Frank uh, Merritt has a few things that he'd like to tell you before I introduce our speaker. Really, my few things boil down to just one. Um, a week. Uh, are we from uh, tomorrow? What's the date today? 14th. 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 A week from today. Um, at the uh, Light Hall, there's a program called On the Union. It's a group of Mongolian throat singers. I think this is kind of a sleeper of a program. Might not get a lot of press, but I went to their website and it was spellbinding. Uh, it was a group of 10 performers and I bought my tickets about four nights ago. Oftentimes programs come to our town and uh, no one really knows for sure what they're going to be like. And um, on one level, obviously this group from Mongolia has never been to Silver City before. <laughs> On another hand, through uh, seeing their uh, website, I was won over and I would encourage you uh, to go to the Will website and look under programs. You'll see uh, a paragraph about them and at the bottom, you can click to their website. When you click to their website, what you get is a one minute showing of them singing. If you see that, my guess is you will be buying tickets. 
Um, so it's not like they, it's not like me to push things. My wife says I never do stuff like this. <laughs> Stick my neck out and, and recommend something. You know, that's not me. But you just heard it. When you order online, um, where where do the tickets go? I mean, do you pick them up at the door or what? The uh, cultural affairs is just in the process of getting their online ordering system worked out for their their programs. Um, you can go to Hunter Hall kind of during typical business hours, and they and that's where I went and bought the so, tickets. Will they sell them at the door too, Frank? Let me put it this way. The question was, will they sell them at the door? A salesman like me would respond this way. If there, if there are any left, yes, they'll be there at the door. Um, there is an online system through the university also. Um, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. So where is Hunter Hall? Pardon me? Where is Hunter Hall? Hunter Hall is near Light Hall. It's, uh, if that means anything, where the, where the program will be. It's kind of kitty corner from the campus from here. Um, it's behind Dr. Shepherd's house. You go up yeah, it's near street. Dr. Shepherd's house. Which is 10th Street. I have a phone number for you. No. Does anybody want a phone number? You go up 10th Street as if you were going to the um, West New Mexico University uh, Museum. Okay. And before you get there on your left, the first building okay. is Hunter Hall. Okay. There's a, a neat little garden. And okay. It's an old, small brick building, two stories. And you park at the top and go in the, the top door. <laughs> it's not often, but once in a while you have an activity where um, Part of, part of the interesting thing is uh, actually getting the tickets. That's a challenge. If you pass that, then you're in for the program. Yes. So this is maybe a little bit that way. Yes. If you want to see that on Mongolia in a ring. <laughs> That's another course. All right, I'm out of here. All right, our, uh, our speaker this afternoon is uh, Callie Kennington. Uh, Kelly is the executive director of the Silver City Arts and Cultural District. Uh, she was born and raised in Indiana. Uh, she, as an undergraduate, uh, she studied fine arts. She received a BA degree in international <coughs> studies, and then she received a master's degree, a master of science in environmental sustainability from the <coughs> University of Edinburgh in Scotland. <coughs> she produced a dissertation that has to do with cultural ecosystem services, which she defines as non-material benefits. I couldn't commit this all to memory. Uh, <laughs> non-material benefits people obtain from nature, including aesthetic values, outdoor recreation, inspiration, sense of pride, and more. So her uh, remarks to us this afternoon will answer, I believe, the rhetorical question that constitutes the title of her presentation, what is the Arts and Culture District anyway? <laughs> now, Thank you for that great um, introduction. Um, I will be presenting with my core team at the Arts and Cultural District, Michelle Keels, Rebecca Martin, and our board president, Lee Groover. So we'll be going back and forth throughout the presentation to talk about different topics. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying that we have a very diverse and robust um, work. We do a lot of different work within the community. It's not exactly one thing you can define, which is why I think this presentation will be quite interesting to some of you. Um, one thing I also wanted to comment on was that we are often confused with many different organizations such as the Members Region Arts Council, Silver City Art Association, Main Street. And so throughout this presentation, one of the things we'd like to help clarify is how we're different from these other organizations. 
Um, so to start it off, I will hand the mic over to Lee Gruber, who will talk about the arts and cultural districts beginning, including history, vision, and town involvement. Thank you. Hi. Could you clarify whether it's culture or cultural? It's arts and cultural district. I had to think about that myself, <laughs> arts and cultural district. Um, I must say that some of my favorite people in the world are in this room and are committed to will, and so it's a great honor to be here and to be a part of Lunch, Lunch and Learn. Thank you. Um, the Arts and Cultural District was established by the state in the years around 2008, and Silver City and Las Vegas were the two beginning communities that were chosen to launch the concept and the actuality of arts and cultural district. And believe me, just like many, many things that are launched by the state, any state or any government, you are given little direction and absolutely no funding. Uh, but you're told to go ahead and get going. And so um, Silver City proudly took on this responsibility and this challenge. So back in 2008, there were a group of community members who got together, uh, and I'm not going to remember everybody's name, but they were people involved in very significant ways with members region arts council, with the university art department, the university museums, the Silver City Museum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a, a group of very interesting and committed people got together and began to write a plan for arts and cultural district. And this was mandated by the state. You must have a plan. You must have a written plan and that will have to be approved. And so that was done. It encompasses a huge, huge book. Um, and so uh, it's, it's quite diverse. And they were challenged to create a walkable cultural district for a community, but include other parts of your community in your plan as well. So there were two things going on. Create a walkable cultural district, but also include outlying areas. So that in itself was quite a challenge. But one of the things that was uppermost on everyone's mind was to include the university. And so if you ever look at a map, um, and this took months, by the way, of trying to figure out what this walkable district would be, but it does include our university. And I know if De Dr. Shepard has anything to do with it, that someday it will be a beautiful walk up College Avenue to the university. <coughs> but the museum, the WNMU museum, had to be included in this plan, and so it was. Um, the vision for uh, an arts and cultural district was to figure out a way to bring a community together and to drive an economy forward using your arts and culture. It's not a new concept. If you go to Washington, D.C., the entire city is based upon arts and culture, and they do quite well there. But this, this is a wonderful concept for small rural communities. How do you take your arts and culture and drive an economy and uh, cause a sense of collaboration between community members? So that was the basic vision of the arts and cultural districts. The town became involved. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how that 
happened. I hope that I don't misspeak in any way. But the idea of collaboration was so vital to the Arts and Cultural District. The fact that we would have the library, the museum, the university, the town, the parks department, um, anybody you can think of who cares about the community and its beautification and its culture work together. And I think the town saw a group of people who were actually trying to do this, not fight with each other. I don't know if you remember the history of the Chamber of Commerce and various things that happened over the years, but no fighting, just looking for ways to work together. No egos involved. How can we work together to drive our community forward? And so the town asked arts and culture to take, to move into the visitor center, which we did, and to become the driving force for tourism, which is viewed as an economic development initiative. So that, that's what happened. Arts and culture um, moved into the visitor center and began the incredibly challenging task of putting our community forward uh, for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. The visitor center uh, came under the domain of arts and culture a couple years ago, yes. And over here to my right is one of the most incredible women who, whose enthusiasm and vision helps to drive the visitor center. And I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca and have her speak to you as well. Wow, that was completely off the cuff. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for having us here today. This is uh, always fun to come and talk to people, and I do like to be at a microphone. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes uh, sharing with you what we do at the Visitor Center. There's the obvious apparent great visitor space. Um, some of you may wonder, you know, where do our visitors come from? And, you know, you'd be amazed at the far reaches of this planet. And I'm thinking maybe other planets at times, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, yeah, they, they come... Uh, the, Last year, in our, I keep statistics, by the way, of who comes in as best I can and gather up where they're coming from and what they're doing while they're here and how long they're hanging out and all of that great stuff. And last year, our number one country was Canada, interesting, uh, followed hotly by Germany, which we see an incredible number of folks from Germany. The um, Old West, the Southwest, is very popular there. So. I engage a, a lot of times with folks. Sometimes they speak English, sometimes they do not. And yeah, I've gotten very good at pantomime um, for that reason. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of places they come from. We had even Zimbabwe last year, if you can imagine. So yes, people from all over, uh, are people in the U US who come. Of course, there's a lot of other New Mexico people who come, a lot of people from Arizona and Texas, as you might expect, but Florida, Minnesota, you know, there's a lot of weather um, decisions that get made, I think, on vacations. People go, where the weather is better. So in the summertime, we are better weather for people in Arizona. And in the wintertime, we are better weather for people in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting how it that, uh, evolves over the course of a year. Um, what you're seeing up here on the screen is some of the uh, graphics that we exhibit at the Visitor Center all the time. So you are looking at right now, these are events. We call it our event monitor. And any event that we think might bring a visitor to hang out for a little while, maybe stay longer than they thought, plan another visit back, we put up on the monitor, giving them just a little bit of a teaser, telling them when it's going to happen, and what website or who to see for more information about that event. You'll also see our attractions up there, things like the museums, things like the cliff dwellings, and the City of Rocks, and the things that people go to see. And you know, most of the visitors we see in the visitor center are doing 
a mix of things. I think that's one thing Silver City offers that you don't find necessarily just everywhere. Great hiking, three million acres of forest, and an awesome cultural experience, which is why it's so nice to have the Arts and Cultural District driving the visitor center, because it gives me, you know, full reign of all the goodness of our town. And many people come and are quite surprised at the, I want to say sophistication of the people that they meet and the opportunities to do things that go beyond just hiking and a bunch of cowboys, which is kind of what I think they had in mind. So it's, it's fun that way. And I think the Western Institute for Lifelong Learning is another great thing. I talk to people about that a lot when they come in because if they're thinking about coming here and they're looking for things to do, I say, hey, you know what? You can hook up with those will people, have yourself a ball, learn all about the area, have lots to do. And they're just amazed. And I'm sure some of you might even be people that I've uh, communicated that to in the past. <laughs> it's kind of fun to be at the visitor center, meet new people who are coming to town, and then uh, keep seeing them around the community. It's great. Like Bright Bee? <laughs> I remember those days. Uh, anyway, those are things that we do. The um, other thing that's not being displayed up here, though, would be the calendar, the online calendar. And we use that as a reference. Somebody walks in and goes, what's going on today? What can I go do today? So who's got music tonight? What other special events might be happening that could be interesting to someone, you know, not only a local person, but someone from outside as well. So our local calendar, and if you have an event yourself, if you're part of an organization putting on something, be sure to include that on our calendar at visitsilvercity.org. That's our main website. You can go to the calendar and enter all the information about your event, or if you're shy about that, get the information on who to contact and either call or better yet, send an email. The other things that we do there, um, well, we've got a lot of things you might not expect. For one, well, remember who, who operates it? The Arts and Cultural District. So of course, there's going to be art exhibits at the Visitor Center. Right now, there's an exhibit on the Gila River Festival. So what we try to do is put exhibits that are timely to the event that's approaching. So if you'd like to see some lovely art, that is in respect of and celebration of the Gila River, come by the Visitor Center and see that. Once that's done, the next big event coming up is the Red Dot Art Fest. So that'll just be an art fest, because we've got all kinds of great art in there for that. And Because uh, it's anything could be, it doesn't have to be any particular topic, it'll be quite exciting, I'm sure. And then immediately following that, we're huddling to Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos. So there will be a great exhibit there um, in Mexico. In, oh, yes, New Mexico. <laughs> I love New Mexico. I love Silver City. Uh, all of that. So uh, anyway, we do a lot of things like that. We have receptions. Like we recently had an exhibit up for the Southwest Print Fiesta, that brand new event that I hope some of you got a chance to go to because that steamroller, wasn't that great? Watching that thing roll up those prints. Um, anyway, we had a reception there for an artist who was from out of town, but exhibiting his work, and he was one of the artists featured in Steamroller and getting a workshop. So we had a reception for him there. So there's all types of activities that go on at the visitor center. And again, if you're part of an organization planning something and it fits in to bring the people downtown, and you want to have some kind of reception, let me know. We, we like to uh, have a lot of community activity at the visitor center. So it's not just for people from out of town. We have all the basics, the maps and the bathrooms and those good things. But um, and hey, when you're downtown, need to go stop in seven days a week. Um, <laughs> if any of you are terribly bored with your life, don't get enough activity through Will. Do talk to me after because you know we do. Um, right now, I'm not obviously at the desk. There's a lovely volunteer standing at our desk, greeting visitors right now. You could be one of them. So let me know. I always have to solicit when I'm up here. And uh, Kelly, it's back to you. Thanks. So tourism is definitely one of our biggest responsibilities as, an arts, as the Arts and Cultural District. Um, and running the Visitor Center is just one component of it. So next, uh, Michelle and I are going to talk about our marketing and advertising responsibilities. So Michelle is going to talk about where we're currently advertising Silver City and 
how we're representing Silver City as a whole. Hi. So I am basically I'm the administrative assistant at the Arts and Cultural District, and I've been there for four years, and that's when we started. Uh, they had just gotten their first uh, largest tax award to do marketing for the town. Uh, it has been uh, really educational, and uh, we have come really far, and we've learned a lot. So we really try to pull a brand together to put out to the world about Silver City. And we focus on, of course, our attractions and uh, the, you know the various things that Silver City is well known for. Uh, the Cliff Dwellings, the City of Rocks, uh, now the Catwalk again. Um, then focus and bring them in to, to town. The historic district is about second most popular after the forest and the cliff dwellings for visitors. The art scene, of course, the cultural diversity, you know, the many, many things, the restaurant scene, just so many things. And on and on we could go. So we have a wide range that we focus on for our advertising. Uh, we basically do most of our marketing through print advertising, although we have really branched out in the last couple of years. And we have a lot of digital advertising in big format. So we want to go big whenever we can. If we can stretch the dollar and make a big presentation, we will do that. So um, we advertised in the international airports of El Paso, Albuquerque, and Tucson this past year. Um, following the footsteps of the New Mexico Tourism Department that is featuring in more international airports where they can afford to go. Um, we really run a campaign that mirrors the New Mexico Tourism Department. So, you know, it's not just Silver City, it's come to New Mexico. <laughs> um, then we also are currently, we uh, have a collaboration with Grant County Tourism and we are doing a, uh, what we call the trolley in Tucson. I don't know how many of you folks have been over there recently, but if you see the streetcar downtown, you'll see a huge image of the cliff dwellings driving people to our website and advertising Silver City. And that's going on for a whole year. We also do digital advertising in the Rail Runner Express. And that uh, is, we have done that for the past year and we have just signed on for another year of that. And so that will mimic our monthly advertising that we're doing in New Mexico Magazine. Um, others? <laughs> the social media, you can talk about. It. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, one of the things that we have branched out to more recently this year is social media advertising. Um, that started with our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest, which are our three main presences at the moment. Um, when I started as the director in February on Facebook, we had around 6,000 likes or fans of Silver City on Facebook. And after a pretty 10-week um, campaign of Facebook advertising, we have now over 13,000 fans, so it's more than doubled in that time. And we really see this as a way that's moving in the future. The average American checks their social media 17 times per day. That's at least once every waking hour. So as well as the print media, the billboard, the digital advertising that we're doing, we're really trying to branch out into the different social media markets and make the most of that because it's instantaneous results. People will engage with you, they'll like your posts, they'll comment on it, you can comment right back, they'll send you messages asking questions. So that's um, really neat for us to see um, those dollars being spent and instantly seeing results from people who we were targeting in El Paso or Albuquerque or whatever market we're reaching out to instantly like our page, instantly send a question about where's the best place to go fishing or something like that. That's really neat to see for us. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about as well was collaboration, which ties into our Facebook advertising that we've been doing recently. So Michelle said that we had been collaborating with Grant County Tourism, and it's not just on the trolley. We also, that Facebook campaign that I was just talking about is a lot of collaboration with Grant County Tourism to make our dollars stretch as much as possible and spend them most effectively. Um, so that's one way we're collaborating. Another 
way we're collaborating is I'm sure that some of you might have got out this past Labor Day weekend with all the different events going on. So one of the things we did was help to facilitate that collaboration between those different events, put out um, print advertising, advertising them, but as well as that social media advertising to advertise Silver City as a destination for that weekend specifically and all of those events that were going on. So for that, um, let's see, I thought I wrote some numbers down. We did a Facebook marketing campaign um, with, people, with those different organizations all contributing a little bit of money towards that. And we had over 49,000 people engage with the posts that we were advertising. So that's a huge number. Over 200 shares, people clicking and sharing with their friends. So that's even more engagement to get Silver City and that word out there. And so as the Arts and Cultural District with tourism, we really try to foster a spirit of collaboration in all that we do our tourism marketing being one of them, but also our responsibilities as an arts and cultural district. So wrapping up the tourism section, um, we then wanted to talk about some of our arts and cultural district responsibilities. Lee, would you like to hit me? Okay. So one of the things we were commanded to do by the state was to establish a what they called a coordinating council, which was to meet, uh, well, once a month. And uh, so the Arts and Culture District went, went ahead and did this. And uh, the people who said it is probably the most fabulous meeting and I attend a lot of meetings every month. But at the second Thursday of every month, there is a coordinating council meeting in the visitor center conference room. And it is something to behold. Because sitting at the same table, you have everyone you can possibly think of who's, who is involved in arts and culture in some way with this community. We sit together at the table, and that includes Main Street, the town, the small business development center, the university, the museums, the library. Um, I, I'm forgetting others. Will, oh thank you, <laughs> Will. Will sits at the table. So many, many different people. The people interested in theater, people interested in dance, people interested in movies. We come together and we sit at a table together. People interested in hiking, the forest. We have presentations. Last week, Cecilia Bell talked to us about Fort Baird and their plans. In, in any event, the attempt is to sit at a table together and to listen to each other. What are you doing? What are you trying to do? What is your vision? What are, what are your hopes? How can I help? The museum says we're opening an exhibit and uh, women of the Southwest will be featured. And so the library says, well, I can bring in a speaker who can supplement that. Um, or somebody else says, oh, you're having that event. I can volunteer or I can have 10 people from my organization show up and help you. It is one of the most amazing things to just sit there and see this and listen to this and, and see what happens when collaboration begins to take hold. And you know, I say to people, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to develop trust between each other. You have to understand that, yes, she'll actually show up, or she'll actually do what she says she's going to do, et cetera, et cetera. But it's truly uplifting to be at that meeting and to see 10, 12, 15, sometimes 20 people listening to each other, directing organizations, and trying to figure out how to work together and support each other. So that's one of the things that we do. The other thing the Arts and Cultural District was commanded to do, no kidding, you, you will have a signature event. No money, 
penny. Absolutely not one penny. But you will have a signature event. And because I have involved, been involved in clay um, all of my working life here in Silver City, the idea came to me to have a clay festival. Whether that was good or bad, I'm not sure. But after five years, um, the goal and the vision was to try to bring people together, connect people through clay. So not just pottery, but archaeology, any food, food production. We did a whole thing this year on uh, food and land use. And uh, so anything that has to do with mud, dirt, land, clay, you name it, to try to create a festival that would bring all of those things together and have people come here from, um, now we want them to come from Mexico as well. So we subtitled the Clay Festival from, San, from Oaxaca to Santa Fe. And the goal is to recreate that route that existed for thousands and thousands of years and connect people all the way through. So the Clay Festival is the signature event for the Arts and Cultural District. Yours truly has resigned as director. This lovely young, and I repeat the word young woman, <laughs> is, it will be directing, but um, that's another thing that the Arts and Cultural District is responsible for, a signature event. And uh, the last thing that one of the last things that I can speak to is the Clay Arts Trail. Looking at a way to develop a trail, it's a four county initiative that involves archaeological sites, museums, individual potters, studios, galleries that handle clay centric kinds of items to develop a trail that people will come to and will visit. Uh, again, involved with tourism, trying to figure out how to get people to our area and keep them here. Is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just something I wanted to clarify. So we've gone over our tourism responsibilities. Lee spoke a little bit about our responsibilities as an arts and cultural district. One thing that often gets confused is the Clay Festival is our signature event. That is the only festival in Silver City that we are personally responsible for putting on. As the tourism entity, we help promote other festivals from different organizations, but we don't actually, we aren't actually the organizer of those different festivals. Only Clay Festival. Um, and then I also wanted to say, um, Rebecca mentioned something earlier, which I think is really important about how the arts and cultural district districts work as an arts and cultural district fits so nicely in with tourism due to the different influences that Silver City has. Um, we're not membership based or anything like that. Basically, I guess you could say as a whole, our goal as an organization is making Silver City a better place to live and visit and improving the quality of life for residents here. So the next thing I want to talk about actually was some of the work we do in regards to that quality of life work. So um, we often pursue grants that we believe will help to better Silver City for both visitors and residents. A couple of those that we have received recently, um, we received a grant to install a freeze resistant, vandal resistant, water fountain and bottle filler with an additional pet fountain that will go outside of the visitor center. And we believe this is really important due to the fact that the Silver City is a gateway community for the Continental Divide Trail. We often collaborate with a lot of different greenways groups in that way. And the visitor center in particular is the official trailhead in Silver City for the Continental Divide Trail. As well as that, we have a lot of people coming through, pedestrians, walking their dogs, hikers, you know, visitors. Water is something that needs to be easily accessible to people. Um, we are open seven days a week, so people can come in and get water in that way, but this will really help in regards to that when we're not open after five or after two on Sundays. So we'll have water accessible all the time. Um, the next grant that we are working on putting into motion right now is a grant we received from the Department of Transportation 
couple years ago <laughs> and um, that we are working on currently. This grant involves um, the greenways and trail systems as well, and there's three main components to it. So one is implementing signage that will be used to direct visitors and locals in the direction of trails within the area. The next component is a brochure slash map component that will show them where these different trail systems are and promote the connectivity of their trail systems within Silver City, which is very important to us and we're trying to promote that further. And the third com component will be a kiosk, which again will be located outside of the visitor center. So we're really trying to promote the visitor center as a hub of connectivity. We have a pretty large parking lot that people have been using, you know, to park at, use the pedestrian bridge and go to the Silco or go shopping downtown. And we really want to continue, we really want to continue to promote that connectivity and that hub so that people can park there, go on a walk, ride their bike, because there's so many different trail systems, San Vicente Trail, Boston Trail, uh, botanical gardens that are accessible from that area and that goes along with what Lee said about the arts and cultural district being a walkable district so that is very important to us um, something that we're looking for in the future is to kind of to further promote that area as a hub redoing the parking lot repaving it beautifying it making it safer and more welcoming for people who want to use that area as a branching off point in Silver City so that's a big part of the work we do as well, is quality of life improvement projects and things like that. Um, next, I wanted to talk about kind of current and upcoming projects that we're working on that kind of fall within our responsibilities as an arts and cultural district as well as a tourism entity. So the ones I just mentioned, of course, um, one thing that we're working on currently is a piece that will represent Silver City to be sent out to different um, visitor centers and things like that. Some of you may be familiar with the 25 reasons to love Silver City. <laughs> Rebecca corrects me before I'm up. Um, that New Mexico Magazine put out. So we are working on creating a new piece that will represent Silver City to uh, potential visitors right now. It'll be a six by nine booklet that will be accessible to people interested. Um, we also have a new website rolling out shortly. We currently get a lot of compliments on the website we have now. I'm not sure if you visited it at visitsilvercity.org, but it is actually quite outdated. So we are revamping that and making it more streamlined and user friendly for people to visit. And it will be um, mobile accessible too. It'll show up well on smartphones and, and other mobile devices. Um, a project we recently just finished was we redid the uh, map pad, map things that we distribute to the hotels. <laughs> I'm very eloquent map things. Um, <laughs> that we distribute to the hotels as well as provide to the chamber to send out to relocation package it for relocation packages and things of the sort. And um, we are taking over now the brochure wrap program that was previously done by MRAC. And we feel it'll be a better fit for us, given that we are the ones that are the main tourism entity for the town. And so we're really happy to take that on as well. And that will be, we're in the transition process, so it should be soon. Um, so I, I think that gives a pretty good round out of all of our different responsibilities as far as tourism, quality of life, our arts and cultural districts, and as you can see, we have quite a lot on our plate as an organization and many responsibilities that I feel like really contribute to Silver City's character and Silver City's success as a whole, as a town. <laughs> so are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Oh. Do we have more than one? <laughs> no. I'm just curious how you're using Pokemon Go. Ah, <laughs> Rebecca. Dude, I am all over Pokemon Go. <laughs> well, because I'm such a good team player, I play myself just so that I can be conversant with the young folk, especially who come in. But we have two Pokestops right there at the visitor center. 
So yes, if you're playing Pokemon Go, you can definitely come in and, and get, um, catch some good Pokemon. Feel free to put on one of the lures and catch them and share with me what level you're at. Any Pokemon Go papers? <laughs> Team Mystic, go! Okay. <laughs> I played for a little while with her, but I kind of got bored of it pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> any other questions? I think I heard you mention a botanical garden. Could you explain where that is? I'm not aware of it. I can still do that. <laughs> she, uh, Kelly was referring to the botanical gardens that are on Virginia Street that are connected to the waterworks. And so uh, the, the dream is to, you know, make that more well known as it gets developed and have more use out of that. And it also has Virginia Street Park right across from it. So it's a, it's a great location for the greenways. Yes. In that vein, uh, everybody should go as the Silver Creek Botanical Garden, which is run by the Hilo Native Plant Society. That's right. And we have meetings once a month, um, but you should come sometime and find out about native plants in here. Yeah, it's an awesome, awesome space. I live near there, so <laughs> I'm lucky. Have uh, other towns besides the original two been uh, designated as arts and cultural districts in the state. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have, although I'm not sure of the exact number. Anyone? Uh, nine. I think there are nine of them, yes. And the other thing uh, that the state has done is designated rural, there's a rural community division now. For example, Santa Clara is is a part of that frontier that's right frontier communities so uh, for communities that are a lot smaller and also trying to promote themselves i will say that uh, new mexico tourism you know they do this um they put forward the new mexico true campaign and some people make fun of it um, but I myself am pretty supportive of it, and they've done a beautiful job with advertising, I think. They've done away now with the true or false bit, which I found a little bit annoying. But when you walk through the airport in Chicago or L.A. or Seattle, and you look up and see these New Mexico true huge, huge canvases advertising our state, it's... Uh, it's pretty impressive. So I think they've done a good job, and we've we've tagged along because you know they've given us a matching grant of forty thousand dollars every every year. Not this year. Guess what? <laughs> um, so as Lee mentioned earlier, Silver City as well as the town of Las Vegas were pilot programs for the arts and cultural districts. I just wanted to mention also that Silver City is often looked at as a model for what an arts and cultural district could be. And personally, I think that a lot of our successes has to do with um, our tie with tourism, since it's such a natural fit for our organization and for Silver City. Uh, you mentioned Grant County Tourism. What is that, and where where do you how do you collaborate with Grant County Tourism? So Grant County Tourism is led by Becky O'Connor. Yeah. Yes, led by Becky O'Connor. Um, that is funded from Grant County Lodgers Tax, which is the ones that aren't in Silver City necessarily, but the tax is collected otherwise. We collaborate with them as much as possible, given that Silver City is kind of the destination for Grant County. Um, one of the ways we collaborate with them is, as I mentioned earlier, we have recently been participating in social media, Facebook advertising. So they contribute some of their advertising dollars, we contribute some of our advertising dollars, and get to get the most bang for our buck in advertising Silver City to um, 
potential visitors. Another way we collaborate with them is how Michelle mentioned, we um, have a huge um, ad on a trolley cart in Tucson. And it is a picture of the Gila Cliff Dwellings, which is one of our major attractions that we advertise for Silver City. And they contribute, again, some advertising dollars, and we contribute some advertising dollars, and that really helps us stretch our budgets as well as them. Any more questions? I don't know if this is uh, the type of question you were, were expecting to ask, but uh, at the visitor center, at the north end of the parking lot, at one time I heard that it was going to be an electrical charging place for cars that are going to be using batteries. Uh, is that still in the function, or what's going on with that? Kelly in <laughs> I know since this happened before Kelly came to the scene. Uh, I don't think that that is a plan anymore. We used to, um, the Green Chamber used to be housed in the Visitor Center as well. So Sissy McAndrew and it's heads up the Green Chamber. And it was sort of a pet project of hers. And the, um, well, along with sustainability, which is the new office of, of the town. And there was a monitor in the, inside and it powers half the power for the visitor center and the monitor was for visitors to see and read and see how it works but it went defunct and they took it out yeah so at present it is a functioning solar gain for the building itself yes but not for the vehicles however we do have outlets outside so if you have one you can just pull up and plug it in <laughs> Since you're not monitoring the train. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I can just ask if that my uh Lee, when are those meetings for the visitor at the visitor center? Are those open to anybody? Yes, uh, second third okay. the second Thursday of every month. Um, at okay. nine o'clock in the morning at the visitor center. In the conference room. Yes, and you'd be most welcome to, to attend. Um, let me add that. We also, uh, for those meetings, we welcome guest speakers. So if you do have an event coming up or you would like to do a, a short presentation at the beginning of the meeting to the group, um, let us know in advance so that we can schedule it and, and we're happy to have you as a guest presenter to talk to the group about what you're doing and introduce yourself. And those are great meetings. Again, um, with the collaboration, we're all about it pretty much, whether it be um, to stretch our marketing dollars or sponsor an event during the Red Dot Art Fest, or we're promoting, I don't know, it's it right there. Worldwide Instameet photo scavenger hunt. A young woman who just moved to Silver City put together a official Instagram group, and she is has organized an Instameet to coincide with the official Worldwide Instameet days, and it'll be this Sunday if you would like to join and are any of you Instagrammers or photographers even, um, you're more than welcome to join that. Can you explain more about that for those of us who don't know like Instagram or Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Instagram is a social media platform and people use it to share photographs mainly. It differs from Facebook in that Facebook has multimedia. You can do text, videos, pictures, share different posts. Instagram is just photography and videos. Um, so a lot of so naturally a lot of photographers are interested in doing that. Um, so in, that's what Instagram is. Insta meets are meetups. Uh, fans of Instagram and photography they come together in different cities and take pictures around the town. And we're getting involved because um, it's a natural fit for us to bring people down, want to bring people downtown into the arts and cultural district, promoting Silver City. It's walkability. And um, this young woman's put it together. Her name's Kitty, and she has organized a photo scavenger hunt downtown. So it'll start at a space gallery at 12 and go till 3 p.m. And there are prizes that you can win if you complete the photo scavenger hunt, I believe. 
it's done on your phone. So you will meet in real life and walk around with a group of people, whoever shows up. And I am assuming from the photo scavenger hunt idea is she'll have a list of different things in Silver City that you can take pictures of and downtown. And then at the end, you'll meet up at the Toad. It'll end at the Toad and you'll share some food and, it's, and upload the photos to Instagram that you take. So it's a really great thing for Silver City to promote us, collaborate with them because they're interested in doing that as well. Um, we're trying to work with the university. That's one of our challenges as well is getting university kids downtown and engaged and plugged in with them. So we're also working with the student activities coordinator to promote that event. They are meeting for an optional breakfast, waffle breakfast at the Market Cafe at 11 a.m. on Sunday. Brunch, yeah, that's brunch. brunch, sure. Sorry. <laughs> breakfast for me. <laughs> I, I just want to say, Frank, I don't think you mind, but um, you can see the diverse age group in this arts and cultural district team. And it's such a pleasure to begin to understand these things that she talks about. <laughs> uh, but uh, Frank, Frank and I have talked about um, looking at the young people in our community and putting together some kind of advisory group because they are full of ideas and ways of doing things that just sort of fly over our heads. But it's really exciting. So it's such a pleasure to have these women on board. Really, thank you very much. My team is awesome. Any last questions? I think we're. Now we got time for one more question. Okay. For me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I used to see these billboards off of Highway uh, I 10 said 375 species of birds, Silver mm. City. 339. Do you, folk, do you folks articulate with the local Audubon Society? They have these birding, these bird counts uh, around uh, around the environment, sometimes countywide. Mm -hmm. Is there is there anything like that that, that would you guys either digitate or however you want to say it? I think that is one of our um, goals is to get better plugged in with them. We do promote Silver City as a birding destination, and that's um, you know on our social media. Sometimes it'll be in our new booklet that's coming. Out that I talked about to promote Silver City. So we're definitely trying to touch on all of the great things that make Silver City what it is to promote this place. And we have birding information at the visitor center. There's a birding trail. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So yes. And there and the Audubon Society brings their newsletter to us. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, then thanks. Thank you. Thank you.